United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Does anybody have any changes to the uh, order of the agenda that they want to bring forward? I move for approval of the order of the, the agenda. Second. Vote. Okay, and the motion passes 7 0, except Commissioner Reinhardt, I don't have your vote. Oh, I'm on the wrong button. Oh. <laughs> Is that me? Okay, thank you. All right. I think I know that one by now. I move uh, for approval of the minutes of the August uh, 6, 2009 meeting. Second. If we're all ready, unless there's discussion, we can vote. And that motion passes with Commissioners Timms and Chilvers abstaining. At this time, we normally hold the public forum for anyone wishing to speak on a topic not appearing on the agenda, but we don't appear to have anybody present to speak on that. So we'll move on to public hearing for case number ZA0903, an ordinance amending Chapter 26 concerning parking regulations. Do we have a staff report? Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, Ken Johnston with the Community Development Department. Um, You've heard this uh, before at a study session, but I'm still going to, for the benefit of the viewing audience, go through a relatively detailed PowerPoint that goes through the high points of the uh, proposed uh, ordinance. Uh, this is a comprehensive rewrite, uh, repeal, and reenactment of uh, Chapter 26501 uh, regarding off street parking and loading. Um, going to hit a little background on the, some of the issues that led us to uh, propose these uh, um, amendments to the zoning code. Uh, certainly an overview of, of the details of the ordinance and then uh, welcome your, your questions and comments. Uh, this is one of the projects that was on our short-term list of zoning code amendments, part of that broader project of, uh, of amending our zoning code to be more open for business and, and streamlining some of our uh, development approval processes. Uh, we discussed it in more detail with the Planning Commission at a study session back in April, April 16th. Uh, in real general terms, uh, we feel like uh, some of our parking regulations can present op obstacles for development or, more importantly, redevelopment. Uh, to some extent, uh, our parking regulations, like many cities' parking regulations, are really uh, designed for new development, for new construction, new site improvements. Uh, as, a, as a community, we're really forced, faced more with uh, reuse of existing sites and redevelopment on uh, challenging infill lots. So uh, we think our parking regulations can be more uh, fine-tuned and tailored to those types of uh, development uh, situations. Uh, as I mentioned, it is a full repeal and reenactment of Section uh, 26501. Uh, there's a, a whole new applicability section. There's a new um, section on shared parking. Uh, there's a new section on parking uh, reductions, so specific allowances that allow uh, property owners' developments to reduce their parking requirements, uh, new requirements regarding bicycle parking, uh, and then in general we're just trying to uh, improve kind of the uh, usability of the, uh, of the document. So to go through an overview of some of these changes, uh, there is a, a purpose statement that's new that, that spells out some of those intentions that I already mentioned in terms of uh, trying to achieve the right balance in the amount of parking and being sensitive to the development context that we operate in, which is, uh, again, one that often deals with uh, reuse and, and redevelopment. Uh, the applicability uh, section uh, better defines when different parking requirements uh, are triggered, whether it be the uh, the provision of uh, the parking spaces themselves or when different design requirements are triggered. Uh, it, it recognizes that for new development, of course, full compliance would be uh, required unless an exception would be granted through a, a planning commission or city council approval process, but then makes some more flexible allowances for uh, expansions to existing properties or uh, changes of use to existing properties. Uh, specifically, in, in regards to changes of use, uh, it requires uh, less than full compliance with the uh, current parking standards by using a 75% factor when determining the new parking requirement for the change in use. Uh, 
we think this gives a little more flexibility in terms of reusing buildings for, for new purposes, but also uh, recognizing that we still, we still do care about getting um, a sufficient amount of parking. Uh, this is uh, illustrating uh, one of the charts that's in uh, the, the proposed ordinance, uh, this one again specifically in regards to the expansion uh, and how that methodology is, uh, is, is calculated. So it both illustrates the fact that we're trying to use a more, uh, more tables and graphics to illustrate the requirements, uh, but then also gives this example of if you uh, were to uh, add on to an existing building, how the requirements that we uh, are proposing would would not be as stringent as a full compliance situation because it recognizing that it's not a uh, new development. Uh, shared parking, another topic that we're uh, trying to encourage. Um, Again, not to be too repetitive, but when you look at some of our uh, commercial corridors, uh, 38th Avenue, Wadsworth, uh, Kipling, 44th, where we're trying to encourage revitalization and reuse. Uh, in some cases, you may have a, a great reuse for a building, but uh, you may not have an ability to provide sufficient parking for that new use on that lot. So we want to provide reasonable provisions where uh, you can you know, go to your property next door the, or the next door beyond that if it's uh, within that 300 feet requirement and negotiate a shared parking agreement. Uh, we are not allowing that, it, uh, that the parking be across a collector or arterial roadway uh, for pedestrian safety, and we are requiring that uh, you have direct pedestrian access between the shared parking lot and uh, the use in question. Parking reductions is another uh, topic that is a, a new topic for the, the, the new ordinance. Uh, there are certain buy right uh, deductions that could go up to a 25% uh, reduction. Um, there's review criteria. Uh, there's a provision that uh, spillover parking has to be addressed, uh, traffic circulation has to be addressed, uh, and it, we reserve the right to require a traffic study to look more carefully at some of the trip generation rates that might be associated with the, the types of uses that are being proposed. Uh, examples of some of the, the instances that would create an eligibility for parking reduction, uh, proximity to transit, uh, whether that be a fixed transit station such as uh, the city will be receiving as part of the Gold Line uh, commuter rail expansion uh, on the north part of town at uh, Ward Road and 50th, uh, but also uh, for fixed, uh, for bus transit if it meets certain uh, headway requirements. And I have to check the ordinance for sure, but I believe it's uh, peak hour 15-minute headways, so the bus has to be a relatively frequent um, bus in order to be eligible for that transit, bus transit uh, reduction. Uh, also allowing reductions for providing um, bicycle, motorcycle, uh, and or scooter parking. Uh, and also as an incentive uh, to encourage structured parking from an urban design perspective and recognizing that that's an expensive uh, proposition, uh, that is an, another example of an eligible reduction. Uh, there is an administrative approval process for that, which is some, something we're trying to uh, encourage with the um, appropriate um, criteria that, that, again, ensure that there are no significant spillover impacts that would uh, unduly burden the on-street parking in some situations or uh, lead to a concern with spillover parking on an adjacent property. Uh, parking ratios we haven't proposed to do a whole lot with. Uh, we did take a careful look. Uh, we surveyed, um, I think, 11 other jurisdictions to compare our uh, parking ratios to those jurisdictions. We also did some more national research in terms of looking at uh, some of the planning literature uh, to compare uh, our ratios. In general, uh, we feel like ours are fairly consistent. Uh, we are proposing two reductions, uh, one for eating and drinking establishments. We're proposing to re reduce that requirement from one, per 75, one space per 75 square feet to one space per 100 square feet. Um, We've also proposed that for medical office uses that our standard is on, was on the, is currently on the high end at one per 150, uh, and we're proposing to change that from, to one space per 200 uh, square feet of floor area. Um, certainly be glad to talk about that more. 
Uh, I think we included a little bit of commentary in the uh, in your packet, just discussing the fact that we we do believe that medical office is a real opportunity for the community, opportunity to attract relatively high-paying jobs and and capitalize on the great asset that we have in, in Exempla Hospital. Uh, and there is a they have stated that there is a a desire in, in that hospital community for additional medical office space uh, in Wheat Ridge. That's a spillover, a good spillover from uh, from Exempla. So. Uh, hoping that that reduction in parking requirement uh, would maybe uh, be an incentive for people to do more of that type of development. I would also note that um, we haven't established maximum or proposed maximum uh, requirements, which is something that we talked about with the commission um, uh, at the study session back in April. Uh, you felt, and I think we we agree that the community probably isn't ready to do that, uh, given that we still are a relatively auto-oriented community. So. There's nothing stopping uh, property owners from uh, providing more parking than our minimum standards. Uh, bicycle uh, parking is another thing that we wanted to encourage in this or in this ordinance, uh, and require in certain instances where uh, we think it makes uh, sense. Uh, so it would be mandatory uh, for uh, land uses that are close to transit or bicycle routes. Um, and there is a reduction, so there's an incentive uh, for uh, in the amount of vehicle parking that is required uh, when you are providing bar bike parking. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, some, the, some in the area of outstanding policy questions that maximum parking is something that, uh, based on previous direction, we've not included. So that section has been in, uh, removed from the proposed ordinance. Um, we also had had some discussion of whether there should be an on-street credit um, and that currently is not included either. Uh, there's currently in our in our city there just isn't a lot of on-street parking, uh, particularly in, in relation to uh, commercial uses. Uh, so it, it it's hard. It, there wouldn't be a lot of applicability for on-street credit. I would note that the existing code uh, already has one uh, one area where we, uh, in some way, give credit for on-street parking, uh, and that is proposed to stay. And that's in residential districts. Uh, in residential districts where there, where the streets don't accommodate on-street parking, uh, the parking per unit is four uh, off-street spaces per unit. Uh, if there is on-street parking, it's reduced to two. So that provision would stay. Uh, there had been some discussion of whether additional landscaping should be uh, required, uh, whether just as a general design uh, recommendation, whether there was a feeling that we should have more landscaping in our parking lots. And then also, one, it was also proposed as another basis for granting a parking reduction. I think the, uh, the Planning Commission direction at the study session was that there wasn't really a good relationship between uh, reducing parking and adding landscaping. Uh, so that is currently not included uh, in the proposed ordinance. And then one additional um, provision that has been provided, that has been added to the current ordinance, is that back out parking is currently not allowed onto streets or over sidewalks. Uh, while we certainly don't think that's a, a good practice in general when it could be avoided, uh, we also realize that on some of our more uh, smaller infill sites, again, uh, such as on 38th Avenue and 44th Avenue, that there may be instances where that uh, type of a back out parking uh, movement could be addressed safely and could be the only option, really, for providing parking in those situations. And we'd uh, not want that to become an obstacle to redevelopment if it could be done uh, safely. And with that, I would be glad to entertain questions. Anyone want to want to start? Anybody? All right, Ken. <laughs> I, as I said, I, I I I apologize. I don't know if I missed these things the first time through, or they weren't there, or what. But I I do have several questions. Um. Starting out, could you clarify for me, we talked about this um, a little bit earlier, what happens when two businesses enter into an agreement over shared parking? Um, the way it's currently written, uh, should either of those parties become uh, interested in ending that relationship, there's no way for them to do that. The only way to get out of that relationship currently um, is for the city to do it. Um, can you uh, address the concerns that the business owners may have in those shared 
uh, parking agreements? Are we going to put ourselves in a position where uh, nobody wants to sign a shared agreement because it may actually make their business more difficult to sell down the road because this has been entered on, it's been attached to their deed, um, and they have to abide by it? Yeah, that's a great question. The, uh, we do think it's important that the city have a role in uh, allowing anyone out of a shared parking agreement. We've essentially used the shared parking as a, uh, as a means of um, getting around the standard requirement of simply providing it on your own site. So we need to ensure from the city's perspective that uh, if property owners desired to get out of the shared parking agreement that they had another way of providing the appropriate amount of parking. So we'd want to have a review role there, uh, an ability to say uh, no if they, they didn't have an alternative backup plan that, that uh, met our requirements. Uh, but I, I recognize the, the fear factor, and I think um, from a practical perspective, I would hope that um, myself or someone in my shoes in the future would certainly entertain uh, requests from property owners to, to get out of a shared parking agreement. But it may be worthy of, of actually noting that uh, in the ordinance that uh, a, a request to uh, initiate um, removal of a shared parking agreement could be initiated by one or both property owners. owners. And, and, and then just put it, right, and then just put us in that review um, mode, but, uh, but make it clear that it's, it's not a unilateral, uh, you know, you can't even start the discussion unless I, I decide to sort of thing. Right. Okay. Um, uh, is, can, I, can I, can we stay on? Yep, stay on that one. I actually, I'm, I actually think I fall down on the other side um, of John on this issue. Why would we position ourselves um, to want to be between two private contracting parties? I don't think that we necessarily want to. I mean, my point was just that there's no way for those property owners to get out of that agreement the way the, the ordinance is currently written. And so I was looking for some way for the property owners to get out of that agreement. I mean, basically, the way it's written now, that agreement is it's attached to the property. It's, in effect, in perpetuity unless the city decides to back out of it. It's, it, in its simplest form, it's a three-way agreement, and it gets recorded with the county, so it would, would show up as an encumbrance um, in the county records. Uh, the city would be one party and presumably two. There could, though there could be melt more than that in terms of the private side of things. So um, I, I think a, as a practical legal matter, all the parties would have to agree <coughs> to uh, somehow disassemble that shared parking agreement. But I think the intent of Commissioner Dwyer is simply to say that uh, the current language seems to s maybe suggest to some that only the city is, is the one making that final decision as opposed to it being a, a three-way conversation that could be at least initiated by any one of those parties. I guess I would hate to be in a situation, and I'm not sure where this goes in terms of what we're doing tonight, but I'd hate to be in a situation where I had a joint parking agreement that was a recorded document that I had a right to rely on in the city and my, in the adjoining business without my consent took away my my rights under that agreement. I'm, I'm, I'm a little unclear. Um, I mean, that's, this is a bit essentially an agreed to contract and encumbrance on the property. Why would the, why would I be okay with the city and my neighbor deciding what my parking rights are against my will? I, I don't know where that takes this conversation, but right. to, I mean, uh, well, if you didn't have something like this, then you, I mean, pe you, people could uh, do uh, an agreement to get reduction in parking and then and then abolish that agreement after the project's done and and then it's a way around the parking requirements without actually so I'm, I would think you'd have have to have some sort of uh, provision like this in there otherwise it would get abused right no I, I I understand why the the city wants to have this done this way and um, and and I agree with it for the the reasons that he just elucidated. I, I am a little bit concerned about the property owners. So mm -hmm. we may need, I don't know that we need to add anything to it, but, um, you know, I, I did want to clarify how you can get out of that right. agreement. Um, 
Section E standards, sub D, page 9, sub 2. It says parking for, we're talking about RVs. Um, and it says that uh, parking for RVs shall be limited in an RV park to uh, 30 days. And I was wondering where we came up with that, and it seemed pretty arbitrary. And I just don't, I don't understand the purpose behind uh, that provision. The, uh, the RV parking regulations have not been proposed uh, to change. So those, uh, they show up in a little different section than they did in the, the existing ordinances, but otherwise uh, those are repeated from the uh, existing code. So I, I must say I can't speak um, necessarily to the intent of that limitation. Can we stay on that same point on RVs before? Sure. Do you mind? Yes, please. Um, if you go to page 25 of the packet, so the section on section 2, parking of recreational vehicles and trailers, that hasn't been changed either? That's correct. Okay, because I drove around my neighborhood <laughs> and I, I don't have enough hands and fingers and toes to tell you how many are in violation, not only of the um, two, but of the being completely hidden from view behind a six-foot or taller screened uh, structure or vegetation that completely screens the vehicle. I don't, we might have to review this at a later date because the reality is the, f the moving homes that are, that are now parked in people's lots, they're as tall as the houses sometimes. Right. Right. especially in the older sections of Wee Ridge. So I, I'm... We could actually stay right there. I, I, I had a question in the same spot. It says that the, the vehicles, the recreational vehicles or trailers that are, going, that are going to be parked there have to be less than six feet in height. Now, I don't know of any recreational vehicles that are less than six feet in height. Um, I mean, my SUV is over six feet in height. Um, I'm not quite sure how anybody could possibly comply. It says the vehicle or trailers have to be less than six feet in height. That's the exemption, though. If they're shorter than oh, six feet. Oh, that's the exemption. Okay, again, so there would be no exemptions because it can't be. Well, but the, the, definition of, um, the, the def definition of RV and trailers includes things like boats on, on trailers. So th oh, there okay. could be some, not RVs, but things that meet the definition that, uh, that are less than six feet in height. Okay. It, is there any setback required for uh, higher vehicles like RVs? Um, not that I'm aware of. So, so they can they can park a 12 foot RV, 12 foot high RV, right on their property line. <clears throat> Was that all you had? Well, I, I'm just saying, since we were revamping this, clearly we'll go, we could go forward with everything, but we should revisit the, the applicability and the validity of this um, mm -hmm. based on modern day realities of recreational vehicles. So. Yeah, I, as you can perhaps guess, that, I mean, there is some history on our, the RV regulations in the, in the community, and that's why we, it wasn't really our target in terms of the, the intent of this ordinance, so we just chose not to really delve into that at all. Uh, if we were to delve into that, I think uh, we'd certainly look at our, how we notice uh, this hearing in terms of outreach, more aggressive outreach to the residential community uh, would be important. Thank you. Do, do you think we should um, in, enforce the existing regulations, or do you think we should be revising the these these regulations, or you don't know yet. I I mean that's in your neighborhood. Enough your information. Okay. I I can just tell you that my drive through District One um, found more than twenty in a very short period of time, um, especially with the ranch housing. Um, that they they were either taller than the house, they were not screened, there were toys, so a recreational vehicle plus a trailer, plus a boat plus possibly um, like a, a toy trailer, like for tr um, motorcycles or something, all there. And th this is multiple occurrences of it. Well, then, 
then this is something, this is an enforcement issue rather than uh, an issue with the ordinance? Are you I'm saying that we, it needs to, I'm saying that if we're reviewing this as a whole, that this should be reviewed at a later date, if there's a concern. If there's no concern and we're going to do this. I, I, I will answer your question, yes. We should either enforce it or revise it, one or the other. Well, I understand. Since this is a repeal, in fact, and a reissuing of the, the whole section, this would, in fact, regardless of whether this was there before or not, in essence, we're putting it all in anew. So it should, in fact, all be up for our <clears throat> debate and modification. Now, I don't know if you want to actually tackle it, but... Do we, I suppose we'll have an opportunity down towards the end of this to decide which, if any of these things, we're going to advocate for change. I think it's fair to say there's a general sense that the regulations don't address all the current circumstances in the RV issue, but I don't, we can certainly, anybody who has the appetite for it can tackle it in a motion at the, at the end. Do we have any other topics we'd like to bring up? John. I just I have a couple um, more in the miscellaneous section, um, page 23, uh, section J restrictions on the use of non-residential parking areas, um, which basically I guess, and this is also for uh, L. I think um, the the real question is of whether or not businesses uh, who are currently not in compliance are going to be grandfathered in. On um, uh, on having to pave, or I, I'm thinking specifically of a business at the end of my block that's a auto body, who frequently has cars parked in front of his building on 44th for more than 72 hours, and is he going to be required to somehow find other places to store those vehicles as soon as this ordinance becomes effective? Yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a fairly broad um, grandfather clause in the applicability section. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I thought that I got a little confused on And the only caveat that. to that would be the fact that we have um, another ordinance that we'll be talking about uh, later this evening uh, regarding residential off-street parking surfacing requirements, and right. that would, if, if approved, that would repeal some of that grandfathered for the surfacing standards specifically. That's why I was confused yeah. about whether or not he was going to have to immediately... Um, find that. And that's it for me. Henry? Um, I, I have a couple editorial uh, comments. Is it too late to change <coughs> some things? The first one's kind of a general one. In, in, in the first, <laughs> on the top of page two, I've read A many times, and I don't understand what that means. Can somebody explain that? <coughs> the, the intent of that is that um, a use, we don't want... It's, it's related to, to Commissioner Dwyer's comments. I mean, it, it basically says that if, if you're nonconforming in regards to parking, um, you, you can continue and be grandfathered, but you can't get rid of, uh, of parking that would take you out of compliance. Uh, I don't know if there's a better way to word that, but, uh, I, again, I read that several times, and I didn't understand that. So that's just a okay. comment. Um, Then on the bottom of page 15, um, under surfacing, there's there's a sentence there. It says, uh, "Shall proper, properly shall be properly graded for drainage and on-site detention of stormwater or storm runoff. Detention is not always on-site detention is not always required, and that's covered in different uh, section. I, I think that ought to be stricken somehow." Because it could get confusing that you're 
requiring detention in a in this section when it, it's it's covered elsewhere. Um, I interject on that. Perhaps that and between drainage and on site should be an or. Well, it could be detention or retention or. Well, that's that's what I'm getting at. I mean, this has certain meanings, and it gets confusing, and it really doesn't have any purpose in this ordinance because it's covered in another. You know, you could just say, shall properly be graded for drainage and, and be done with it. I think that's, I mean, that's if, correct. If, if you wanted to, you could refer to another section, but I, yeah, I don't Because not all sites, as you point out, right, require right. detention, on-site detention. Um, then on the next page... Um, the, the the last sentence on, on that the continuation of that paragraph um, shows up in in many places. And in other places, it says that you know where, where you have gravel or, or the, I forget the exact wording, but when you have not concrete or asphalt, that you need something to hold it in. Right. And here, here it's it says. Uh, it doesn't make that. It, I, I think this wording should be similar to the way it is in other locations because this says you have to have it even if it's asphalt or concrete. I, I don't want it to be misread to mean that you have to have curb every place because I don't believe that's the intent. So do you just want the uh, the part in parentheses struck? Is that? Well, just I. Uh, I'd have to find it again elsewhere, but but you know what I'm talking about. I do. Yeah. yeah. It, You're looking for the consistency in life. Yes. Yeah. Um, I guess I brought this up before and lost, but I feel so strongly about it. Um, on, on page 17, the uh, very top, uh, Roman numeral three. Um, we're requiring sprinklers, sprinkler irrigated sprinklers in a in a semi-arid uh, environment. That's something I don't think we should be doing a lot of. We should allow more xeriscape um, uh, and and that sort of thing. But uh, I guess I lost. Well, keep in mind this that number three. I don't disagree with you, but that number three is under the heading landscaped islands and parking areas. So. It's not advocating you have to have a sprinkler system if it's all concrete. It's just saying <clears throat> if you have plants there, keep them alive. Well, we're requiring islands, though, if it's if it's large enough. Right. And then, you know, and, and okay, say you have something with 32 spaces, then you have to have an island and you have to bring irrigation to it. And it may be the only irrigation you're required to have on the whole site. Uh, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but um, Ken, on that point, I'm, I, I agree with Henry, and I'm, I'm wondering um, if, as a minimum, it could have the the additional sentence that says something unless an appropriate zero escape. Solution were present a uh, uh, zero escape solution were presented and approved by the by you. I mean, it seems like we ought to at least allow for the option. And I, and I would say that we do encourage we do encourage zero escape as a general matter in our in our landscape regulations. Uh, I think it becomes a question, and I, I I'm not a landscape architect, so I you know, I don't. It, there's probably some concern about the viability of any plant. Uh, in a in a hot environment like a parking lot, I mean a particularly hot environment like a parking lot, uh, needing some sort of drip irrigation. It certainly doesn't have to be a spray head that's going to, um, you know, be spilling the sidewalks and things like that and and uh, evaporating and wasting water. But um, but again, I'm I'm not I don't know whether there are some some plants that could be established. They're certainly going to need water to get established, but after that point, could get a, get by without irrigation. I'm not asking you to solve the problem. I'm asking to allow for the possibility that somebody else solves it. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that. The, my only my only concern would be there is some resistance to putting in irrig irrigation for sometimes just pure financial reasons. And 
again, not being a landscape architect, I just these these landscape islands typically have trees. I mean, that's why they're there. And without some drip irrigation, I'd be concerned that a tree really isn't going to be viable in a landscape island in a parking lot um, without some drip irrigation. I don't know, but uh, I mean, I'm, I'm. Go ahead. Uh, using the term xeriscape to me implies there are plant materials. So if we're clear on that, if we're just going to use gravel or concrete, that's something different. And we can. Uh, it's very easy to install irrigation that does not spray anywhere, and you will not even see it. The city uses a uh, subsurface irrigation on their sod along 38th Street, so there's no water hitting the street. And uh, there is cost involved in running an irrigation line under a parking lot, and if that's that might be the objection right there. But in the big scheme of things, I think we need to do some kind of landscaping around our city. We can't just not have any. Some of our older run-down uh, shopping centers have nothing, and they're horrible. And they're not what we want in this city. It's not what I want in this city. So we can't just let people go and have no irrigation, no plants. I, I, I completely agree. Agree with that, but I I believe that I actually agree with both of you, and I don't think those are inconsistent requests necessarily um, in terms of this this language. I mean, I, I'm working on a site which um, we uh, we have a certain amount of this problem, which requires we're, we're going to have both. Actually, is where where it's going because we we have to limit the amount of water we have. There's some environmental liabilities. And there's uh, there's portions of our site which we're going to have uh, flow into bioswales, which absorb and clean the water. And in those portions, places where it's just not appropriate to have irrigation, we're looking at, at solutions. I'm not again. I'm not asking you to solve the problem. I'm asking you to allow that somebody might without without because my my experience is if you have a language like this, there's going to be sitting somebody sitting at your front desk and going. I don't care how beautiful and perfect your solution is. It says right here you're going to do it this way, and I would I would join Henry and suggest that there, we allow for the possibility of an alternative at the discretion. Of, and I guess I've talked my way out of this. So my my contention is we need to have the town look good. That's what I'm concerned about, and I think that's what you're concerned about too. And how we arrive at it, there's lots of solutions. But I just don't want to say let's just pave it, pave the whole lot. Oh, I, I, I completely agree. Yeah. I don't disagree with that either. Next. Uh, Ready for the next I, uh, yeah, item? I think so. <laughs> um, on page 21, under miscellaneous, it's B, and I may have lost my place. Maybe this has a specific. Uh, application, but um, it's, the last sentence says double loaded spaces, parking where one vehicle blocks another are considered unusable. So you can't count those. I, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, duplex and residential places where that's how the parking is. And are you, are you now saying that it's not going to be allowed anymore? I think I would say that, and I think you're right that that certainly is how a lot of residential parking is provided. Um, I think I don't think we've enforced it that way, but I, I think you're you're probably correct that we could. So it it, it could deserve um, this is existing language, but I, I mean it could deserve a caveat, um, such as except in single family and multi sing, single family and duplex residential or something like that. Yeah, and then in the next. Uh the next back out parking. I made a made a note here. Let me see if I can remember. Oh, I just I just was noting. It says unless an exception has been granted by the director of public works. Uh, that this is a safety issue. So I hope he doesn't just um, grant those exceptions exceptions without looking at it. But I don't think he would.
think I had one more somewhere here. Oh, uh, pa page 26B, rear, side and rear setbacks. It seems to me that the first sentence and the last sentence is just repetitive. I, I don't know why it's repeated that way. Maybe there's a reason, but I couldn't figure out why. I think they're a little different. I'm trying to see if they're consistent. Um, the first sentence, recreation of vehicles or trailers stored in a side yard need not meet any setback requirement. And then the last sentence, uh, is recreational vehicles and trailers, so that's the same, but it says less than six feet in height and stored in the, the backyard do not need to meet rear and side yard setbacks. So you're saying you need both of those sentences? I think so, because okay. I think in the side yard, it doesn't need to meet any setbacks. In the rear yard, if it's less than six feet in height, it doesn't okay. have to meet Okay, I understand that. And then on, on the, I just noticed one more thing in the last page. Uh, number nine appears to be a repeat of number seven. Number seven has to do with stacking spaces, and then Number nine has drive through and vehicle stacking spaces, and they say the same thing as a, a reason that we're saying it twice. I don't. I don't believe so. And that's all I have. And Steve, um, it's fascinating to what each commissioner kind of picks up on. Um, just a couple of quick comments here. Um, starting on, I'll start backwards and work forward. On number 20, on page 27, and another section you put in the footnotes wasn't changed, um, but number four, variances to residential parking standards, and you have a sentence in there, request for variances under this subsection J shall not be charged the fee if the request is filed by December 31st, 2004. Can you just strike that since we're obviously past 2004? And that's a, yeah. that's just, yeah, I mean, yeah, just, you yeah, notice yeah. that too. That was my easy question. Um, and then on page 24, subsections 2 and 3, spacing of vehicle access and curb cut widths. I do agree with you overall when we talk about that the, that the majority by far of Wheat Ridge now is going to be infill and redevelopment, and we don't have greenfield development to a large extent like some suburbs. And, and general parking standards typically do well with those greenfield developments, so we have to be a little bit more creative. Um, I would like to see, um, I'm fine with the regulations in two and three, but I guess I would like to add a little bit of discretion. Number, like For example, number four there at the bottom, number D, you said that public works director may approve a modification. I guess I would like to apply that to two and three as well, that there may be some situations um, where maybe it, the access needs to be closer, maybe it needs to be 23 feet instead of 25 feet, or the curb cut needs to be 9 feet or 25 feet. I guess I'd like to have a little bit of discussion with the Public Works rather than automatically jumping that to the Board of Adjustment for a variance. So maybe we could just expand that um, Public Works Director. Um, it's kind of an administrative modification for 2 and 3 if, if uh, other commissioners are okay with that. I'm sorry, I didn't follow you. Could you give me the site <laughs> where you started again? Uh -huh. this, is, this is on page 24, um, subsection 2, spacing of vehicle access. And then number three, curb cut widths. Um, basically, um, just allowing um, in specific cases to have a public works director uh, modification to those standards in, in certain situations, as in accordance with um, number four at the bottom, subsection D. He wants to add the, the same D language. Yeah, no, yeah uh, two four. and three. I got, yeah. I got it now. Yeah. Without Ed having to go to the, a board of adjustment for a variance on that. Just to encourage flexibility of some with redevelopment. And then my main question has to do with, and maybe you'll address this as part of the next ordinance, this, uh, this parking lot surfacing, um, which is found, where was that found here? Oh, page 15 at the bottom, right? So is the, is the next proposed ordinance that we're looking at going to replace all of this? I guess my particular question is this 25 feet. 
um, which is what this is, this is saying, right? You only have to pay the first 25 feet except for agricultural lots. Um, I personally don't like that, and so I just want to see if um, it seems to be in kind of in conflict with the next ordinance, and so I just find out what is the relationship between the two. Uh, this is the existing language. Okay. We have not changed it in this ordinance, but the uh, it's not in, in the next ordinance. It's not proposed to be changed either. So, if, to the extent uh, that we could defer that discussion, maybe to the next discussion, the next ordinance discussion, that would probably be the appropriate place to discuss that. Um, and then two other points. Um, do you feel like your staff is? Um, I mean, do you feel comfortable that your staff can make some of these interpretations and calculations, I guess, with with some of these shared parkings and, and so forth like that? I mean, it's, I looked at it, and it can be a little complicated, and so I just want to make sure that... It, it is a little complicated, and we, we've run through a few scenarios in, in some of our staff meetings to kind of get a, a feel for it, and I think, uh, yes, I think we can. Um, that's all the questions I have right now. Yeah. yeah. I'm holding back to the next one. <laughs> Jim? Well, I, I think just to follow up on, on, on the uh, previous comment, I always hate to see the same thing mentioned in two different sections because then when you change one, it gets lost in the other one. So maybe, maybe surfacing shouldn't be discussed here and should be just referred to the other section. Uh, the, the intent was to um, was to reflect any surfacing changes that get that get changed through the other. They were just on different tracks, so we tried to just keep them on their different tracks. In the event one or the other oh, okay. got sidetracked, we'd still be able to keep the other one moving forward. That was the intent. Just follow up on that, because we do even within this servicing requirement, we have it actually twice in here, right? We have it on the bottom of page 15, and then it's found again on the top of page 24. So even that could potentially be a duplication that, that may be confusing or, or not caught later on if, if edits are made. So I would maybe encourage the consolidation of, of both of those into one. Okay. <coughs> okay, I think with that, do we, any other additional issues from anyone? Um, I think what we need to, if there, is there any more general open discussion about where we are in the process and what recommendation we'd like to take back to staff as to, or are we, go ahead. Um, recreational vehicles. I'll throw myself in here. Um, I know you had not intended to look at this as part of this um, review, repeal, and et cetera. Um, as it is right now, as written, any neighbor could uh, reasonably complain and, and, uh, have his other neighbor, all the 20 that I counted, um, have a code violation based on, based on the whole, um, the whole requirement on page 25 regarding parking of recreational vehicles and the exemptions and the locations. And so I'm, I'm having difficulty agreeing with the whole thing when this piece wasn't touched even though we, we have some critical issues here. And, and the, the main problem is the fact that since we are an older city and, and our residents, many of our residents have been here a while and they've been able to amass enough discretionary funds to buy toys, recreational vehicles and boats, et cetera, et cetera, and um, they choose to put them on their property, they're in violation of this code. So. I'm, I'm trying to find some equitable way to address this. Jim? Uh, the council went around and round with this several years ago. And I don't know if any 
anything was happily resolved. In most cases, many of my neighbors have code violations that I ignore that because they don't really bother me. And so I think when somebody's RVs get too many, then their neighbor will complain and then they'll get action will be taken. So I guess I don't want to sit here and resolve the whole issue once and for all right now. Okay. Can I can I back us up a step? Because by my count, we have 12 issues that we could potentially um, make recommendations on. And so I guess I'd like to have a sense as to whether we are going to essentially recommend that we move this forward and then amend the motion with each one of these issues, try and resolve each one of these ind individually, or it, is that the path we're on tonight, or are we going to uh, potentially send the staff back for to, to, to try and clean up the things that concern us? Uh, I'd like to know what the sentence of the commissioner is with respect to what recommendation we ought to broadly make here. Has that already been uh, put on the agenda for a city council meeting? We have placeholders on an agenda, but it's it's not it's not been formally published. We we had we're tracking for the September 14th first reading, but that can be changed. So I didn't hear anything that was earth-shattering in all the all the 12 items you have, or however many. I mean, a lot of them were were uh, minor or cleanup type stuff. My again, my only concern and and. Jim has a good point about letting sleeping dogs lie, so to speak, on the recreational vehicles issue. Um, so I, I just wish we'd address everything at once if we were going to do a whole repeal. But I, I realize the sensitivity on this. So, and but I, I didn't hear anything earth-shattering in anybody. So case. is it the, is it then the. Would there be a consensus to, re to recommend that he move it forward with a series of identified minor deficiencies in the language, or are we asking to see it again before we send it to council? I, I think I think we should send it forward with with these comments and and then let them deal with it. Uh, how? I, I I don't think there's anything in here that 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 we need to see again. Is there anybody who disagrees with it? Okay. All right. So that gets us to are we going to are we going to pick through the 11 I wrote down and see the other two I probably missed or are we going to suggest that we gave Ken enough direction for him to move forward? Does Ken feel he could has enough of the sense of the commission to move forward, or would you prefer, do you need us to go through as a group each one of these items and see where we come down? I prefer you gave me conditions. Um, I think that would Fair be enough. a cleaner handoff. All right. So I have a list, and I'm not going to claim that in the middle I necessarily caught it all or, or, or took it through, but I th maybe if we had a motion to, to move the ordinance forward and then a series of amendments conditions of conditions that we would like to put on staff to move it forward so I need a motion an initial motion to move forward the ordinance to City Council subject to the conditions and then we can all add conditions Mr. Chairman I do move to uh, recommend approval of uh, case ZOA-0903 an ordinance repeal and reenacting section 26-501 of the Wheat Ridge Code of Laws pertaining to off-street parking and loading for the following reasons. The proposed ordinance provides a balanced approach to providing the right amount of parking. The proposed ordinance encourages the use of alternative modes of transportation. The proposed ordinance will allow for greater flexibility in the reuse of existing buildings and sites and will encourage revitalization along the city's commercial corridors. And the proposed ordinance implements the goals of the neighborhood revitalization strategy which has been adopted as an element of the city's comprehensive plan uh, in conjunction with the following additional conditions um, to be stated. Second. Should we, I think we should create the conditions before we vote, is that? Yes. Okay, so at the, 
I'm going to go through what I wrote down and see if anybody feels they need to work on a condition for it. The shared parking agreement. No. Let's go through that one. Okay. RVs, do we want to tackle any additional direction on RVs? No. <laughs> we can move that they bring us back an RV later if we want, and then once we've concluded we can, we this issue. We do that as a, as a uh, off topic. Okay. Um, there was grandfathering language that was in doubt, and with respect, I think it was gravel in the driveways. And I, we have another opportunity to tackle that later, do we not? We're... Yes, the, okay. the, the second ordinance you're considering tonight is, is currently focused just on residential, but it does deal with the uh, surfacing. Okay, wording page two, number two. <laughs> Paragraph. Paragraph. I'm sorry. It was A. It was, page yeah. two A. This is the one that you weren't clear what it, what it meant. Oh, okay. Henry was asking if it could be written. Yeah, I was it's just asking. If, language. Yeah, if, exactly. If, if it's clear to everybody else, then no, uh, we shouldn't add it. But it's still not clear to me, so I think the wording ought to be looked at. So is, would somebody like to make the – do we have to have a motion on each condition that we're no. asking for? You just – these is are all conditions to the original motion. Okay, so – I would I support Henry that the that this paragraph ought to be rewritten to more match the con, if that's the sense of the commission. Okay. So that's so far you're doing good. You only had one. Um, the language related to surfacing to remove the detention uh, from the language where it said great it was a grading and detention was it? Yeah, and section. Yep. Page 15. Uh, yep. Five. Under five sur surfacing. Right. And we were trying to get consistent with uh, impervious service language that's in other sections. Yeah, it's different throughout. I, I found four different varieties. Is that enough? Well, I think there's there's two issues. Um, Striking the the last phrase and on-site detention or storm runoff. Right. Right. Yeah, that's actually the next one. I. Oh, okay. The f yeah, you, no, you're right. I, I I muddled the issues and when I put it through there. The first issue was sales or storage should be properly graded for drainage and drop the on-site detention and storm runoff language. Correct. Okay. Right. Does anybody believe that irrigation and that the it is is worth giving staff alternate direction in the language in the parking lot that requires curb and gutter and irrigation? I was the one that cared the most, and I'm I think in light of the uh, I'm willing to let it go. And if our landscape over here is <laughs> let it go. All right. Uh, there was a question about usable parking spaces that Henry raised with respect to um, Page whether they counted or not if they were in, impractical towards the requirements, in the re particularly in the residential neighborhoods. Yeah, allow double loaded spaces um, in, in, re in one and two family residential areas. And then I just wrote variance. And I think that, oh, that went to um, whether we were going to give the public work director authority page, over. Page 24. Two, three. As opposed to sending to Board of Adjustment on two and three, I have on my notes. Two and three gets D. It would be D. Right. Right. Okay. And then? And then, uh, um, and then there was another 
I have consolidation of surfacing, consolidation of, oh, um, in the language about park, what you can park on again. Number 11. So consolidate language on surfacing requirements? That's right. It was in two different sections. It was page 25, I think, and then back in the front. So we're not commenting on, on two separate places. All right, what did I miss? I'm sure that wasn't exhaustive. 27, Steve brought up the get rid of the date. Right. In uh, section 4. Subsection 4. Request for variances. Okay. And then Steve brought up, uh, I think somebody brought up, it's redundant on 28 and 29, number 7 and number 9. That's right. Any other conditions that we, anybody saw that we missed that we would like to put on staff? Okay, we have a motion and a second to move this ordinance forward with the listed conditions. Um, is there any discussion? I would just like to say it's our role to uh, nitpick uh, on uh, these ordinances that are moving forward. But uh, in the whole, this is a, a very, very well-crafted uh, ordinance that is being moved forward. Here, here. Any any further discussion before we vote? I may have a vote of the members. The motion passes seven zero. <clears throat> okay, we are ready for uh, case number. ZOA0905, an ordinance amending Chapter 26 regarding off street parking requirements. Um, do we have a staff report? Enter your name for the record. And uh, we do. Ken Johnstone, Community Development Department. Uh, I'd be glad to go over this PowerPoint to uh, outline this ordinance as well. Uh, so in terms of what I'd like to cover tonight, uh, go over the policy issue that's been raised. Uh, this has, uh, again, been discussed. Uh, several previous occasions with City Council at study session, including one study session where the uh, Planning Commission uh, was in attendance, at least some members of the Planning Commission were in attendance as well. Uh, review our staff recommended code revisions that we uh, certainly hope get at the, uh, the intent of what the, uh, the issues are, uh, and then give you an opportunity to give us additional direction. Um, so the, the issue that's been raised is really in, in the overall sense is a need to define a community standard for what surfaces are appropriate to park on in a residential context. Uh, some of the concerns that have been raised by uh, citizens and elected officials are, you know, the, the presence of too many vehicles that are parked on lawns or, or dirt, compacted dirt surfaces. Uh, there are impacts from that, uh, both aesthetic impacts uh, and because of aesthetic impacts, potential property value impacts. Uh, but also uh, real uh, water quality impacts from people tracking dirt and mud onto the public streets, uh, which also leads to higher, higher maintenance costs on the, the, the street surfaces. Um, the, the reason why, uh, while we have existing surfacing standards in the code, uh, the reason that we can't enforce those standards uh, is because they, 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 they only apply to new development, substantial changes in use, or substantial alterations. So given that the fact that the bark bulk of the city residentially um, is existing and has been existing, that we don't really have an ability legally to enforce the surfacing requirements on existing residential development, uh, which is where the concern has arised. I want to go through a few visual examples of what we're uh, to kind of rebuild that consensus as to what we don't think is good and what we maybe do think is good, uh, because that's what we've intended to craft the ordinance around these kind of visual examples. So starting with uh, what we think are, are inappropriate surfaces. Uh, weeds, compacted dirt. We've protected the innocent, hopefully. Uh, this looks like it's parked on a, on a grass surface. Actually, I think it might be two properties that each have a vehicle parked on a grass surface. This partially parked on a, uh, at least a semi-concrete driveway, but also partially parked on uh, compacted dirt. 
Uh, there looks to be two issues here. There's a next to the car. Uh, there's a area that looks to be used for uh, for parking, at least at some times. They're not in this picture. Uh, that again would be compacted dirt. And then the trailer to the right that's parked just right in the on the, the lawn area. Another example of a vehicle uh, parked on a lawn area. And again, th these are all residential examples, and that's where the, the ordinance is currently focused, is dealing with this at a, at a residential level. Some sort of a trailer structure it appeal, appears, and again, parked on, on a lawn area. Uh, this appears to be somewhat of a junk vehicle, but again, parked on a, on a landscaped area. So this is what we, uh, the, the next series of slides is really what we think um, are appropriate surfaces, uh, which is really broader than maybe the current definition of appropriate surfaces because we are proposing to clarify, in my mind, the definition of a hard surface to include certain compacted gravel or crushed stone materials. Typical concrete driveway, uh, crushed, looks like crushed granite, uh, brick pavers or similar product. Combination here of, of asphalt as well as uh, some sort of a crushed rock material. Again, a crushed, crushed stone material. The direction that we've seen thus far from city council, which is really where this issue arose uh, at an April study session and then a, at a joint study session on July 6th, uh, where some commission members were present, was, was the short-term recommendation that, um, that there be no parking in residential front yards on certain unimproved surfaces, including grass and compacted dirt, uh, and then propose that, a code, that this type of a code amendment be enforceable in the near term so that if, uh, get rid of this grandfathered issue or obstacle that, that we can enforce the surfacing requirement uh, in the short term. Uh, there was a longer-term issue uh, that was discussed, and that was really whether at some point in time this should be uh, retroactive to all properties, these surfacing standards. Uh, the direction we got from, from council, at least, was that we, uh, we didn't need to, to do that. We didn't need to make this 100% uh, retroactive on all uh, driveways and off-street parking surfaces uh, for all res existing residential uh, development. So with that, we are proposing uh, the ordinance, and I have just four uh, kind of summary points of what the ordinance is intended to do. Um, effective date would be August 31st, um, and it would make it unlawful to park vehicles in residential districts on the following surfaces. Landscaping, and we currently define that in our code as areas such as uh, turf, ground cover, um, certain rock surfaces with shrubs, but we define that in our current code in section 26502. Weeds, another unacceptable surface, and compacted dirt. Now, in parentheses there, we say with the exception of existing driveways. Uh, we've accepted existing driveways. Uh, the, the feeling on that is that existing driveways that might not meet these standards, it could be onerous to impose a requirement that someone can't use their existing driveway to get to their garage uh, because it doesn't meet this new surfacing standard. Those driveways in some instances could be hundreds of, hundreds of feet long and we'd be asking for, for an individual who's had that in existence for some period of time to uh, potentially go to some significant expense. Uh, we're defining two things. We're defining residential driveways and we're defining hard surfaces. Uh, we're defining uh, residential driveways that they're generally not greater than two feet wider uh, than the garage door uh, on both sides. Uh, and again, to go back to my, my previous point, by defining driveways, we allow these existing driveways, whether they're used for parking or simply as an access to a garage or other off-street parking space, to not be subject to the new parking requirements, parking surfacing requirements. The third point in the ordinance is that we're defining hard surface. Hard surface has previously been referenced in the code in regards to off-street parking and, and uh, loading surfaces, but it was never clearly defined. Um, it was inferred by some language in the code that's been referenced in the, in the discussion about the previous ordinance that it could be something less than concrete or asphalt because there's language that says it has to be contained uh, by concrete curbs or railroad ties. So there was a suggestion that it, there was a lesser standard, but it was never defined. So what we're def 
doing uh, in this ordinance is proposing to define what that hard surface is. Uh, and we're defining it to include compacted gravel, compacted crushed stone, uh, recycled asphalt, open and closed pavers, and other similar materials. Uh, this definition really borrows from the existing definition that's in, that is in the RV section of the parking regulations, uh, which did define a standard for these uh, lesser materials, such as compacted gravel um, and compacted uh, stone. So we're, we're trying to be consistent with some language that was already on the books, but just apply it in a broader way. The, and then to, to follow up on that, in defining this new hard surface requirement, uh, we're proposing to maintain the existing standard, uh, which is that the, the first 25 feet of the driveway, as it connects out to the street surface, must be um, asphalt or concrete, but that the, the balance of the driveway or off-street parking surface can, be, can meet this new definition of hard surface, uh, which includes the ca compacted gravel and the other uh, materials that I've, that I've already mentioned. So that's really the the heart of the um, the ordinance. I know it's a little bit. Back up to the last slide. Sure. Okay. Thank you. I just misread something right as it flipped. That's all. Thank you. So with that, again, I'd be glad to entertain questions. There seem to be a lot of uh, exceptions for the uh, hard surface uh, uh, requirements, uh, particularly on the width of the uh, driveways. Uh, am I understanding that uh, correctly that uh, uh, you are allowing or this would allow a lot of vehicle parking actually on something other than these hard surfaces? The, the only exception would be for existing driveways. So if, it, if it's an existing driveway that provides access to a garage or another off-street parking area, that would, and, and if that material was not up to the current, the new definition of hard surface, those would be allowed to remain. And that's the only exception. But didn't you say that the driveways that extended two feet beyond the garage doors would not be considered driveways? Yes. And also, yes. but vehicle parking would still be allowed in those areas? In, in the two feet on either side of the garage uh, no, door? Pa past the two feet. No, not past the two feet. Let me, let me go back to some visuals maybe. Okay. Try and describe what we think, because we had a few situations. So, so in this instance, it's not a great example because it looks like the. Um, well, let me give you another one. So this this is an example. I mean, it technically, <laughs> maybe it's a bad example as I look at it. But uh, this area to the to the left on the left on the photo of the the truck um, is. You know, two feet of that arguably could be parked on based on the new definition of a driveway being two feet wider than the garage door. But the balance of that, where you can clearly see that it would appear they have been parking, would not be allowable as a parking surface. Could, if they paved that, it still wouldn't be? No, it would be. If they, if if they, they would bring that it. up to the hard surface definition, so compacted okay. gravel, any of those surfaces, uh, they, okay. could, they could you. do that. So this is another example. Um, this would, would not be an acceptable situation. That's not does not meet the definition of driveway because neither of those surfaces are actually going toward to an off street parking space. Now, yeah, you know, the, the the enforcement uh, issue is is never going to be perfectly clean. You know, is that material on the right an adequate concrete surface? You know, there's there's always going to be some gray area there. Uh, but clearly the area on the left, which doesn't meet the definition of driveway uh, and isn't an approved hard surface, would not be allowable. And again, here you can't see the, the, the driveway, or you can't see the garage, but there's a garage door to the right of the, of the brick there. So that concrete, that whole concrete surface, even if it weren't concrete, could be used for the parking of vehicles. But the, the grass material that goes beyond that two feet where that uh, minivan is parked, uh, would not be an acceptable parking location. Other questions? Yeah. So I thought long and hard about how you were going to uh, manage this and uh, to define what happened before August 31st and af after August 31st. Um, 
Is there intent to get a satellite map of the city by August 31st and have that as your as your line in the sand? It's a good question. And, and we have uh, very high quality through Dr. Cog aerial photography that they did the whole region okay. uh, April of last year. So we do have a very high quality existing data set of uh, of aerial photography that, that you can make determinations like this at a, at a fairly reasonable level. Okay. Um, a lawyer would say that April of last year and August of this year um, spans a lot of time that there, okay. there's kind of wiggle room in there. And so I'm, I'm just asking if, if I, as a homeowner, um, say that this was here before August 31st and you show me an April of 2008 picture and it's not there, what, what, I, I'm, I, I'm playing devil's ad sure, advocate. Sure I, first of all, I strongly believe in this, so I'm not arguing the point. I just want to make sure it's truly enforceable. Um, so I, I, I'm just proposing, if nothing else, that another set of satellite be procured right. or, or something closer than April of last year, if possible. So. Yeah. It, it would have. Would it only, anything that had been built since April of last year, would it have fallen under requirement, a different requirement? I mean, it, doesn't ha it wouldn't require I mean, permits necessarily. The, l let me take a step back, and, and uh, I'm going to be kind of thinking out loud here, but uh, the, the effect, the purpose, the primary purpose of the effective date of the ordinance is simply saying that you can't park on these unacceptable surfaces. Um, which, when we look at the surfaces any date after August 31st, we're going to be able to tell whether it's an acceptable surface, right? right. So we don't need any right. aerial photography for that. I mean, if you're parking on weeds, if you're parking on compacted dirt or landscaping, it's got to go, unless it meets the definition of a driveway. And the definition of a driveway is leading into a garage, essentially, essentially or another approved and, and properly improved uh, off-street parking space. And that'll be readily apparent because it either leads to a garage or it leads to an off-street parking space that uh, is properly improved. Okay. So to some extent, we won't need to rely heavily on that aerial okay. photography. Okay. Other questions? All right. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Carports are acceptable parking structures, okay, even though they're not specifically mentioned in yep. the... Um, so the vast majority of my neighbors will now be non-compliant um, because they have one-car garages or carports. Um, they have a side yard, and um, you know they've been parking their vehicles on these side yards for years and years, and they have no crushed gravel or pavement or, or anything else. So the city is going to notify these people or they have to read it in the transcript that their parking spaces are now non-compliant and that the city is going to fine them for parking their vehicles after August 31st on spaces that they've parked their vehicles on for years and years. Is that the gist of how this is going to work? Well, well, certainly we recognize that there's a need to get some public information out, and I don't <coughs> envision that, um, you know, there's some, there's some glaring examples of, of things such as, you know, just parking a car in the middle of your yard that uh, might be cited early on, but I think, sure. uh, you know, the, the, there, there's a need for a public information campaign associated with this in terms of newsletter articles and whatever other uh, means we identify. Uh, and be glad to hear ideas from the commission. Um, but yes, I mean, the, the, this does have a real impact out there in the in Wheat Ridge in terms of um, th there's a number of sites that will be noncompliant. And then um, I wanted to ask you about the 25 feet of asphalt uh, from leading from the street. Um, is that the is that hard surface or is that actually asphalt concrete? In other words, if I've got, say, a rock driveway that goes all the way down to the street 
and then all the way up to the garage is that compliant or do i now have to go and asphalt the 25 feet from the street up towards my house it would be part of an if it's part of an existing driveway which i think is, is what you described uh, it, it would be grandfathered for whatever surface it is um, but the the standard moving forward will continue to be that the first 25 feet have to be asphalt or concrete and then the balance of the driveway or parking areas can be this new definition of hard surface and so if somebody comes to the city say uh, they want to expand their garage they've got a one-car garage they want to expand it to a two-car garage um, is that going to trigger a non-compliance at that point will no. they have to then asphalt that 25 feet that was not previously asphalted that's correct I, I, I mean, my whole neighborhood's non-compliant. My house is non-compliant, probably. You know, if if I go to expand my garage, my house is now non-compliant. Would any of my neighbors complain about it? No, because we're all in the exact same boat. So for for us um, in that area, um, you know, this is going to be a pretty contentious issue if the city comes in and tells all of us for blocks and blocks that you know we're all non-compliant because we bought a house built in the 50s that had a one car driveway and perhaps no garage at all and you know we want to do something like go to a second car garage or something like that um, so it, it it's gonna be a big burden in uh, in parts of the uh, the city I'm just I'm not sure that you know, I mean, it's a it's a personal issue, so uh, you know, I'm not sure that I would uh, that I can actually get. But I understand the the reasoning and and completely agree with obviously a lot of the pictures you have and people parking their cars in the middle of their lawns. Um, but for whole neighborhoods that are are not compliant, it's it okay. it seems to be a problem. And. Ken, can you go back to one of the pictures? I just want to clarify, and then I have a question, please. The one that they've boarded up the um, garage, or not boarded up, but that one. So ignoring the dirt on the side, off on the far left, that used to be a garage. Um, because there's a hard surface there, that's acceptable, correct? Correct. Good. Okay, because um, my neighbor's is like that. Everybody else's is like that. They've they've taken advantage, and I'm like that. I filled mine in, but I pulled up the driveway. <coughs> Here's the other question: When you find this trailer sitting here, do you notify the property owner, or do you notify the owner of the trailer? I believe the property owner, but I can't say that for certain. the The enforcement of this regulation currently is housed in the police department's community services team. Uh, we have a split in code enforcement between code enforcement within my department and, and code enforcement within the police department. This particular item gets enforced by uh, the police department, so I can't say for certain. Okay. Um, it would be nice. Um, I didn't see a place in here where it would call for that, but it would be good internally to clarify who would get that. All the pictures that you showed, at least all of them that showed a house, the one, the truck sitting alone, I couldn't tell. These are all multifamily. So the chances are that the owner is not one of these in the multifamily in the duplex. Right. So uh, I just don't know who's going to get the summons or citation or whatever, the, the trailer or the property owner. Right. Okay. Who's the property owner? I... I think it's probably the property owner if this is in the code and not in the motor vehicle but if you could clarify that that's all I have more questions before we open it for discussion Steve um, going back to well, I have two questions one is for new developments going back to this 25 foot rule if, if I were to build a new single-family home and the garage is set back 40 feet from the property line um, According to the current code, I would only have to pay with 20, the first 25 feet. The remaining 15 feet up to the garage could potentially be just be gravel or something like that. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, I don't necessarily like that. I don't know if any other commissioners have a feel about that, especially for new development. Um, but 
I'll defer to the consensus on that. My other question is for agricultural properties um, under this proposed ordinance, right? If you have a single family home on, um, on five acres in agricultural, would this not allow, would this not allow a, a tractor or um, similar type of agricultural equipment to park on grass, I guess, or their field without, would that meet the intent of this or would that be a, a violation? I'm, I'm pretty sure the intent is that this would not apply to the agri to agriculturally zoned properties. I, I'll, I'll look I can look through it again to make sure, but a agriculturally zoned properties are agricultural vehicles. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. Well, because there might be some. You're right. There might be some some properties in the city that that may not that may be zoned agriculturally that. Maybe we want this to apply to. It's just it, we just need to define that perhaps or look closer a little bit to see what's going on with that. Well, the motion says uh, blah, 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 code of laws concerning residential off-street parking surface requir surfacing requirements. I, I know that the, the ordinance we just looked at did, did kind of exempt agricultural property specifically from that 25-foot um, hard surfacing requirement, but I didn't see that same um, yeah. exemption in, in this one. I, I think it's just that that language is not repeated in this because the, we, we limited this um, this ordinance to the the pertinent language that we were amending. We didn't show the whole section. So the language you saw in the previous ordinance that you recommended approval of will still be in place. So you're saying you think this is not does not apply does not to apply to agriculture. Yeah. Well, well, wait a minute. Section 26-501, off street parking requirement, the first sentence, scope, in all zoning districts. Last couple pages. Of now we also may have some properties in the city that are zoned agricultural that in fact don't have agricultural operations and they just are ineffectively zoned and they are problem children, but. I mean, so maybe they need to be under the guise of it, but um, I don't think we want to penalize in legitimate agricultural operations from parking on the crops. Mr. Hollander, the, the, uh, the section you just read um, is the scope section, and that's just, th that applies to all of Section 501, uh, which is all the parking regulations. But we haven't, in, in this ordinance, we haven't shown the full scope of that. So the exemption oh, okay. for agricultural is in a section that's not shown. Okay. More comments and questions? I have, uh, I have, uh, would just really, I guess just one now, now that I think about all the ones that other people brought up. And that is, when you talk about this, with respect to the recreational vehicle section of the code, um, you discussed that there was language that related to uh, gravel driveways or gravel surfaces having edgers. And I was wondering whether any thought was given to and why, if so, why it was not thought necessary for this section. If I heard you right, I yep. don't claim to know the code was. <laughs> um, Did I miss it? I looked uh, for again, it. Again, I think, uh, and I apologize that, that this does not include everything, uh, which is part of the difficulty. So the requirement, um, the requirement for for hard surfaces that exists, and the language that applies to both RV parking and now the new definition for uh, residential off street parking. Uh, included the in, already included the language in both sections requiring the containment of those materials um, the problem was in in this section that that's being modified by this ordinance it didn't define hard surface uh, in the rv section of the ordinance it did but it was specific to rvs it was the language was not worded in such a way that the that definition could be applied to the general residential off street parking requirement is that thoroughly confusing? No, actually, I think I understood what you said. I'm going to take it at faith. You're, you're right. Uh, you just, I think you just put my gravel parking area in the non-compliance, though. I was complying up until I realized that that, that I'm doing there. Um, I think your driveway's gravel, and it's go heading towards the garage, though. And actually, I built an area that doesn't comply, and now I'm going to have to edge it or get rid of it. But. Uh, 
I created a non-compliance here last year. So I probably didn't have a permit. Did I need a permit to create a non-compliance? didn't need a permit. I'm not sure. <laughs> Can you prove it was before August 31st? <laughs> okay. I, I think I, I have enough to know how I feel. Um, so I guess I'd like to open it to general discussion. Um, or I guess technically that's the end of the public hearings, and then it's open to discussion among the commissioners as to how they feel about this ordinance as a whole. And I'd like John to start because I have a feeling he has an opinion. Well, uh, you know, the intent of the ordinance I can, I can back. And, um, you know, it's, it's greatly overused. Um, but uh, I, I have that feeling like, well, I, I know what's a bad parking surface. I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. And um, to me, the ordinance creates um, an undue burden on property owners in where entire neighborhoods are noncompliant or will become noncompliant um, if this passes. So, although I'm sure I'm tilting at windmills here, um, I am not going to support the ordinance as it's currently um, written, and I'm not exactly sure. I'm trying to think of how I would amend it so that I would support it. Uh, but uh, the way it currently is, uh, I won't support it. Anybody else want to speak on that? Can I just get one more definition? What do you define as a vehicle? Uh, <coughs> I can look for that definition. Okay. It, it, does it include trailers? Yes. Okay. And it, it includes all manner of wheeled, wheeled big vehicles? Yes. Does it include snowmobiles? On trailers? Snowmobiles. I don't know that it would... Include snowmobiles. I think and yeah, it does. It's motorized, self motorized vehicle. Oh, yeah. Okay. Any motorized. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I just I realized that when I was reading through this, it has a definition of residential driveway. It has a definition of hard surface, um, and I didn't see a reference to vehicle definition somewhere else in the code. So I just does had to ask. Does it have to be licensed to be a vehicle? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> a bicycle. Let me look and see if I can find the definition. Thanks. While he's, while he's doing that, would anybody like to weigh in on the concept of the and Oh, yeah. Jim? After looking at these uh, photos of dirt parking lots, I don't think it's onerous to ask someone to excavate a few inches and put in some crushed rock as a minimum to, to uh, facilitate parking. I don't think that's onerous at all. And I don't think it's expensive or it's backbreaking, but it's not expensive or an undue burden for long-term parking. I, I hear Commissioner Dreyer's uh, concerns. My concern actually is unequal enforcement of this ordinance uh, throughout the city, that it will be enforced in certain areas and it will not be enforced in other areas. Uh, you know, I, I think there's plenty of room to uh, uh, have some problems with this ordinance. So would you suggest that there are portions of the city where it is and portions of the cities that it's not appropriate in? I just think the enforcement has got to be uniform. Henry, Steve, anybody? I will say, you know, I'm not living in a property that's directly impacted by this, but my first reaction when I read this was I was kind of taken aback about uh, infringing on um, property rights. Um, but then I had a long discussion with my wife, <laughs> who, who uh, kind of uh, educated me on some of these types of things, and, and there is a movement in the city to improve the city, and this is all part of that movement, I guess, and uh, 
I guess I came in here kind of supportive, and the more I hear from you guys, I'm I'm kind of on the fence again. Steve, talk to me some more. Well, uh, I, again, I I appreciate Commissioner Dwyer's stance tonight. One of the good things about our community is that it it just I mean in general it has such a, a wide variety of neighborhoods. Um, this ordinance won't necessarily impact my immediate vicinity either, but I think that long term, I think that the benefits of the community have to be weighed against the individual property rights. And I think some of the issues dealing with with um, tracking onto the streets and with potentially oil and other fluids leaking into the ground, um, long term environmental sustainability issues as well, I think that the pros um, for me outweigh the, the cons of additional um, cost and, and regulation. And so, um, personally, for me, I will support this uh, this ordinance. I'm going to support it. I I believe in the intent of it. I believe it's uh, it needs to be equally carefully applied across. I can see where District One and District Two are going to get hammered compared to some other areas, some other less um, old areas, newer areas. So, but I, I'm going to support it as long as I have an understanding what a vehicle is. I'll support it. We, we don't define it um, specifically, except in language that's embedded in the scope section. Uh, so it's it's simply uh, the scope, uh, as Commissioner Hollander mentioned, in all zoning districts, off street parking facilities for the parking or storage of self-propelled motor vehicles and or licensed trailers. So it does include tractors and agricultural vehicles? Uh, it would with the caveat that on agriculturally zoned properties there are different provisions in terms of um, some of the driveway requirements. I'll, uh, I have to admit that I'm actually conflicted on this um, um, because I, I, I really struggle when somebody tells me uh, what to do on my own property. But the truth is that, uh, that I think it's a, a problem that has to be addressed somehow. You know, I would actually, would in fact almost argue that there are places in the city where maybe some differential standard doesn't necessarily follow with the zone districts or whatever. But I, I don't think that's practical to start going down that road. I think we need the same way to address this. And frankly, I think my own little piece of noncompliance looks pretty crappy and my neighbor shouldn't have to put up with it. So uh, I'm going to vote for the ordinance um, as well. So I, unless there's more comments, I'm open to accept the motion. I'll do it. I move to recommend approval of Council Bill 21-2009, an ordinance amending Section 26-501 of the Wheat Ridge Code of Laws concerning residential off-street parking surface requirements for the following reasons. The parking of vehicles on unimproved surfaces, including yards, landscaped areas, and compacted dirt in residential districts has a negative effect on the community image and property values. Two. The parking of vehicles on said unimproved surfaces can also lead to tracking of dirt and mud onto public streets, resulting in potential damage to the street, cleanup costs for the city, and a decrease in storm water quality, or storm runoff water quality. Three, the proposed ordinance defines a reasonable off-street parking service requirement for all existing residential development within the city. Does, do I have a second? Second. Call, roll call of the members. And that motion passes with Commissioner Dwyer voting opposed. Okay. Thank you. Do we, does anybody have uh, any other issues they'd like to bring up this evening? I, I have uh, just one uh, general comment. Uh, I was looking at the new monument sign at the corner of uh, Kipling and uh, uh, Interstate 70, 
And uh, I was hoping that monument sign would give us an opportunity to have a zero scape demonstration project. And it has turned into a monument to bluegrass. And I'm really disappointed that we didn't take that opportunity to have a zero scape demonstration project there. I, I just wanted to mention that Henry and I went to the most recent Dr. Cog meetings, and I left my notes in the car, so I'll bring them next time. But um, they proposed, Ken, that they could come and do a presentation on public safety and planning on how, how they intertwine. And it was an excellent presentation, and I have the, the speakers. But they said that they could give it to small groups, large groups. They've been, it's a road show, per se. And they can, they've actually, were taking, um, you could, um, could vote with the little cards on, on, on your, your feelings about certain things. But it was an excellent education piece on, on public safety and how it affects planning. So, yeah, I, I'll, I'll bring it in next time and I'll give you the names. It was good. Thank you. Thanks for that opportunity. Anyone else? I had one. Uh, Ken, are you having any luck? Uh, are you getting more staff or are you replacing? Uh, uh, we are. We, uh, in the department, we have two vacant positions that we're uh, in the process of filling right now. We, we had a planner two position, Jeff Hurt, which you all know, um, and that position is closed. We've been through interviews, and we have uh, three finalists that we're uh, hoping to make an offer on in a matter of days to a, to a sole finalist. And so you have somebody to throw up here for us to torture next time? Is that <laughs> exactly a, well, right. good for you. We hope to put someone directly on this zoning code project uh, from day one so to keep it all moving forward. Uh, and then we also have a plans, a combination uh, plans examiner and a building inspector position in our in our building division that uh, we're in the process of filling as well. So, great. Uh, uh, that was all I had. Uh, if there's nothing else, I guess I'll adjourn adjourn the meeting. We have to vote. Oh, I can't do that by myself. I move the adjourn. Second. I knew that. <laughs>